For those of you that listened to part one of the interview with Ruben Boomche Boomche, please feel free to fast forward to the seven minute and 20 second mark of the podcast. If you did not listen to part one, we hope you enjoyed today's podcast with Ruben Boomche Boomche. John, you ready to rock and roll? Yep. Let's go. All right, let's do it. Welcome first time listeners and returners to the Sports Deli, where we believe that less is more. If you- less stands for leadership, equality, empowerment, empathy, education, social injustice, suicide prevention, sports, and solutions. We talk a lot about white privilege. We want to mobilize and pay it forward. The Sports Deli is sponsored by Sport RX. You can give them a call at 888-831-5817 or find them online at sportrx.com. Don't forget to enter the code DELI10 at checkout for your special 10% discount. And now a little bit about your two co-hosts. Dr. J he loves politics. His dad was a civil rights lawyer. He loves golf. He's he played. loves the All-American at Waffle House. As for myself, Hootie Hoot, I'm from Detroit. Well, I got cut three times. Once I played four years of college basketball. I still hold a record where I made five out of six three-pointers in a game. I've coached men's and women's college basketball for 23 years. I have a beautiful daughter. I'm a life coach. And I'm honored to be coaching girls basketball at a low-income, first-generation high school here in San Diego, California. Don't forget, you can always send us an email to thesportsdeli at gmail.com or you can DM us on Instagram at Mike Hootner or on Twitter at Michael Hootner. And with that being said, we are honored during this ninth day of Women's History Month, the day before my birthday and one week before the start of March Madness to welcome an incredible person and a former collegiate and professional basketball player with one of the best names in the history of sports. Six foot eleven inch Ruben Boomche Boomche hails to us from Adea, Cameroon, known for its contemporary dance music genre, Makosa, and is located in Central Africa. Cameroon, one of fifty-four African countries, has had the same president for nearly forty years and has twenty-five million people, the equivalent of the states of New York, Washington D.C., which is not a state but should be, and South Carolina, combined with double the miles in terms of area. It has only one of the three waterfalls of all of Africa that empty into the ocean. When he wears his basketball shoes, he's actually seven feet, not 6'11". He shares a birthday with Israel Kamika Vivole, famous Hawaii singer of Somewhere Over the Rainbow, Cher, James Stewart, and Busta Rhymes. He came to the U.S. in 1996, where he attended Washington, D.C.'s Archbishop Carroll High School, famous for sending numerous players to the NFL and the NBA, like current college coach Johnny Dawkins, Lawrence Poetry and Moten, Eddie Jordan, and his former college coach, the late Hall of Famer, Big John, John Thompson. Michael Steele and former college basketball coach Mike Lonergan also attended Carroll. He went on to play for the late John Thompson at Georgetown before he retired and who Craig Esherick, his head coach after Big John retired, referred to as one of the smartest players Georgetown ever had on and off the court. Mike Sweetney, a former teammate, called Ruben an amazing person and one of his favorite teammates that he ever played with. He has a math and pre-med major and was drafted by the Portland Trail Blazers in the 2001 draft as the 50th overall pick where he played until 2004. Ruben was an incredible student and was a three-time recipient of the team's Scholar Athlete Award at Georgetown and was also named Big East Scholar Athlete of the year in 2001. He was named Big East Scholar Athlete of the year in 2001. He played with the likes of Scotty Pippen, current Warriors head coach Steve Kerr, Zach Randolph, former Michigan State Spartan, Rasheed Wallace, and Damon Stoudemire. He was coached by Sixers great Mo Cheeks in Portland before he went to play overseas for seven years, but only in countries that started with the letter G, Greece and Germany. <laughs> He speaks three languages and earned his master's degree in applied mathematics and statistics, also from Georgetown University. He's a data scientist who has an interest in metrics, which we will get into later, as it relates to sports and has held various jobs in this area, from Siemens Energy to the Philadelphia 76ers organization, where he was most recently a technical scout and the assistant general manager for their G League affiliate, 
the Delaware Blue Coats. He still tries to play ball once a week, and although he used to hate running, he now runs at least once a week for 45 minutes. You cannot find him on social media anywhere by choice other than LinkedIn, which is where I reached out to him, and he was so gracious enough to answer me and agree to join us today. Hey, Ruben, way to get that karma and a huge warm welcome to the Sports Deli. Hi there, Michael. Go ahead. How you doing, John? Good. How are you? I'm good. What's happening? I'm not much trying to manage four kids. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, thank you for having me. That was uh, and, an extraordinary presentation. <laughs> and I got to add one more thing. Ruben yes. was the fourth leading leader in blocks in the history of, of his college, which, okay, you're number four. You know who he's behind? Let me tell you who's behind. Patrick <laughs> Ewing. Alonzo Mourning and Dikembe Mutombo. You might have heard of some of these guys. <laughs> that's right. So when you say you're the fourth and the other three are Hall of Famers, that's pretty damn good, Ruben. Yeah, it, it was – it is great. And I played three years, really. So who knows what could have gone. Right. Uh, no, I mean, those are unbelievable guys, of course, guys that I looked up after, you know, when I was there, just uh, trying to get some knowledge from them once in a while when the um, – who come around for us to play basketball, you know, over the summer. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it was the, it's what I did the best, really. <laughs> Black shot and, play, and rebound and, and trying to play defense. So, um, it's great to be a, a among those guys, but Hall of Famer and some of the great, great players this game ever yeah. seen. Ruben, he's, he, John's the guy that would know who you were from a half mile away from the back of your head <laughs> with a hat on in the snow. <laughs> John, you made an adjustment to your headphones. I'm very, I'm very impressed. Did, Thank did the you. president of did the president of the college say something to you? And and uh, no, no, I'm the only one that comments is you. You, I think you have a problem in your in your setup, whatever the sketch is there. <laughs> hey, what's wrong with my setup? Oh, I mean, where do I begin? <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Ruben, help me out here, man. I can help All right, you. <laughs> So at the end of part one of this two-part series with you, we uh, talked about uh, social injustice and how proud you were of the uh, NBA players in particular and uh, some of your experiences dealing with uh, social injustice. Uh, you know, your wife is white. And so let's pivot a little bit and let's talk a little bit about your time uh, in the NBA you played with some great players. You played with Rasheed Wallace, uh, Steve Kerr, right, head coach of the uh, Golden State Warriors, and uh, Bonzi Wells, Scotty Pippen, just some unbelievable talent back then. And, you know, it was a different game. It was starting to transition back then into what we see now in terms of, uh, you know, if you, were, if you were coming up now in Cameroon, you'd be, you'd be like, da 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 you know, you have that thing on a yo-yo, you know, dropping threes, you know, like Rashid or something. Um, yeah. So how was it playing with Scotty and, and Steve Kerr and, uh, you know, some of the some of those great players being coached by Mo Cheeks? Yeah, um, it was great, although the team was called a gel blazer at the time. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> no, it was. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I was I was lucky coming up as to in some ways, I uh, really was lucky to uh, play with those guys you mentioned, and Scotty Pippen and and Arvida Sabonis and Wow Stoudemire and <laughs> Rashid Wallace and Bonzi Wells and Sean Kemp, <laughs> Wow, uh, Chris Dudley. So. Uh, I played. I, yeah, I was in the team with a lot of a lot of veteran guys. Had a lot of years. Um, different personality. <laughs> so that was always fun. Ruben, Ruben, I got to ask you a question. I'm <laughs> looking at the 2003-2004 roster. It's like yes. a football team roster. There's like 30 guys on the roster. This is the NBA. Literally, I'm going to put it up to the screen. Yeah, it's like it's like thirty guys. I mean, I, I don't. We don't have enough time to mention. It's, am I wrong? Did they have like a turnstile in the locker room? I mean, what was going on? I, I mean, mean, 
for Trinity, okay, we, we had a lot of people coming in and out. It, it was, it, yeah, the competition that, was yeah. years. <laughs> I mean, I mean, some of for this stuff, Derek Anderson, listen, listen Derek, to these yes. college players, Derek Anderson, Omar Cook, Dan yes. Dachau, Jeff McGinnis, Darius Miles, Tracy Murray, Ruben Patterson, <laughs> Wesley Person, Zach Randolph, Theo <laughs> Ratliff, Damon Stoudemire. This is on one team, folks. Rashid Wallace, Bonzi Wells. I mean, you got to be kidding me. This is like a fantasy team dream. I mean, but it's um, it's it's, it's pretty. Yeah. Fun. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, different. We had different guys, and it, it, to me, um, it was great to try to pick up some from those guys. You know, like um, they a lot of all. Of, I think most of them. I think all of them embraced me, especially the big guys. Um, I had Dell Davis <laughs> and yeah. Rashid Wallace. And I actually put my my locker was between the both of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that was fun. My man Rashid, oh the oh, story. Um, right. But uh yeah, and play with like, I mean, play with guys like Scotty Pippen was just kind of like unbelievable because you know, wow. even when I was at school at Georgetown and watching him play and, and with the Bulls and actually be on a team with him, you know, it's a crazy thing because like you get drafted. I got drafted, and the next time I'm like, who's the team? And I start looking at people on the team, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> well, you know, and, then, like, and, huh? and then the other thing is, let's talk about this. This is crazy. I, re- I remember this. The 2003 Western Conference first round. You guys go down 0-3. You come back to tie it at 3-3, and then you lose. You can't lose them. <laughs> Ruben, you can't lose. I mean, it, it, there's no story in losing. You're wasting. I mean, you. We had a crazy like, team. We had crazy players. All of us. Everybody was crazy. <laughs> that too. Paul Mo Chicks. <laughs> Paul Mo Chicks was the the quietest one, you know. And and Steve Kerr were the, the people trying to bring reason. <laughs> did you? Let me ask you this. Did you think Steve Kerr? Did you think Steve Kerr would be what he is today? Um. I mean, I didn't know if he would go into like coaching, right. but there's nothing that I'm surprised about. He's one of the few guys that uh, we actually would talk about things that are not basketball related. You know, sure. just have an yeah. intellectual conversation about different things. So, I mean, I mean, I like the guy a lot. <laughs> I, sure. you know, he. <laughs> it was funny at practice when we would practice. Um, and he probably remember, oh man, when we will play, if the ball gets to Steve Kerr, uh, what we used to say, too late <laughs> or something, some expression, but that was a bucket. <laughs> I mean, it was, just like, it was a joke running out of practice. And he would say himself, you know, like just an un- unbelievable shooter. Of course, like the guys right. now are even like crazy shooter, but I'm telling you like Steve Kerr, when we used to play at practice or in the game, if you were letting your rotation for half a second, forget it. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I'm not surprised. Uh, like I say, uh, very extremely smart, obviously. So I had, he's one of the guys I had those non basketball conversation with, where you're trying to kind of get away from talking basketball right. all the time. Cool, um, right. He was one of them. Um, there was a couple of others. So I'm absolutely not surprised. I'm just, Great guy, great person, great personality. I mean, I'm sure everybody who knows him can say right. the same thing. You, you can't just rave about so, him. So, I, I, you know, your background in the G League, I was actually talking to a current athletic director today at work in higher ed, and we were talking about where NCAA Division One basketball was going because there was an article, four guys, hedge fund money, trying to start a, a league where it starts out at 100 thou, and obviously – now, real first question. So, talking about the G League first, what's the salary ranges in the G League? Like, if you're a rock star, like I watched Kevin Porter Jr. the other night. Now he's a come down. He's a two way, but like it's, a true it's a good friend. Yeah. So he would still be making his rookie contract, right? Yes. But someone who someone who goes decides not to go to college and goes right to the G League. What is the max in your back, you know, ballpark that someone can make? Yeah, I think unless things changed last year, um, if you were just on a GLA contract, I think it was $35,000 for every player. Okay. Um, so the one the one 
who could make a little bit more with a one on a two way contract. And depending on how long you get to be on the NBA team. So basically, sure. I think it's up to 150 days. I can't remember exactly. Okay. And then your money can, then you can make a little bit more money. Sure. Otherwise, you were just stuck at the uh, at the thirty five thousand. Now, um, you could make a little bit more because um, every team actually, like when we were signing players in the beginning of the year, you basically can give them um, let's call it like I can remember it was like let's say some bonus money. So you can sign a guy for fifty thousand dollars on top of his G League salary. So a few guys, depending on what the team. <laughs> decided to do, you know, we had a budget, everything was different. Um, so some of those guys, you probably had like three or four guys making more than a G League salary because they either got some money from the team before or because on a two-way contract where they were able to play in the NBA as well. Otherwise, uh, you basically just got a, I think it was 35 grand. So, you know, the Supreme Court is gonna hear this case about p- paying players. And, you know, it's going to, in my opinion, it's going to really unravel Division I um, because if you don't have a big football program, and even then with the revenue of football, some of these programs might not be able to afford it. I mean, Clemson University can build a state-of-the-art football facility when you're not paying the players. Anything. It's a great model, except for, yeah. the, except for the players. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, everybody else loves it. It's great. But so do you think – now, you were a really good student, so it's probably not set for you because college was important to you and you had a host family and D.C. was an easy tra- transition. But other guys you play with, if you get this league going that pays six figures, 80 to 100,000, and the NCA has to get in the business of that, meaning they, they're going to pay too, do you think we're going to begin getting to the point where two things? One, you're going to see more players go to pay, whether it be the G League having to up their money or this new league? And secondly, do you see Division One, like the Georgetowns of the world, the Big East of the world, breaking away and having almost like an F- FSC, you know, meaning like a, a football, FBS? Super so it's conference. just a, thank you, a super conference. And maybe those guys get paid different than if you're playing at Weber State, no knocking Weber State. Right? <laughs> Why you got to go to Weber know, State? Hey, that's messed I, up. I just, I just picked it out because, you know, and, 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 and Damian Willard obviously went there, but you get the point. That do, do you, I just I just don't th- see this model, and I and, and I'm editorializing here, and then I'll, I'll let you in. Is I just think the you know I think the NCAA is running a taxi stand, and everybody else is taking Uber and Lyft. I think they're five to ten years; they're always behind. They're run by a bunch of old white guys who have no concept, who work for a nonprofit, but are flying charter all over the country, and they're just they didn't think they ever would have to change, and it's just taking them by storm, and I think they're too late to the game. Yeah, I, I think I would have to agree with you. I think they're too late to the game. I remember my senior year, actually, I was asked to, there was a committee um, that they wanted to hear the player side about, you know, if we should get pay or not. And I was asked to participate, and I went and spoke about it. So this is 2000, 2000 I think, or 2001, whatever it was. Um, and you know, the, the, uh, as you know, the, the ongoing conversation about how to remunerate players, um, has been going on for a while. And the NC obviously never went to budge, I think, until the last two or three years when I think it was California, where right. they started talking G- about Gavin Newsom and he did it on LeBron's yeah. show where he signed the deal. Yes, they signed the deal, and then the G League. Um, as you say, with the, the model they have now, with the they have a team now called <clears throat> um, United or something. They have a special team of high school players where supposedly some of the guys got a half a million dollars to play. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now this has uh, the high school team. I think, yes, I think the NCA um, is behind. I think it's going to unravel on them for sure um, because. Even the last couple of years, uh, when I was, you know, with the, the Sixers, we start seeing guys going to Australia, right? Yeah. <laughs> Out of high school, make some money, go to Australia. Uh, that league is growing. Get some more, you know, some experience playing against professional and getting better, and then coming to the NBA, right? <laughs> so, uh, 
it, it, it might happen that Super League that you guys are mentioning, you know, like with a big time team say, you know what, <laughs> we want to take a different direction. We're going to pay the guy. And yes, it's going to hurt the smaller school by a lot, which is unfortunate if that happened. But I definitely can see that model. And I think that the NCH should have gotten the act together a long, long, long time ago. Uh, I, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, uh, you know, when I was at Georgetown, I heard all those arguments, even around campus, people saying they don't know why I was like, complaining we're getting a scholarship for four years. And I would tell people, okay, that is true. I mean, I don't, like, getting a scholarship for four years without paying is great. My parents would, could never afford to send me to Georgetown, as a matter of fact, any college in the US for that fact, right? So, but I used to tell them like, um, outside of that, which is great, uh, guess what I don't have? Okay, I do have a car to go to the um, uh, to eat all the time in the cafeteria. I don't have anything else. I was working every summer on top of taking classes to have a little bit of money. I had, I mean, if my guardian did not give me any money, which I actually refused to take from them, I basically had no money. I didn't have money to buy shoes. I didn't have money to buy clothes. I didn't have money. And on top of that, for two years, I had to pay taxes as a foreign oh. player. Wow. Right? And back then, Which they is, didn't let you work. They didn't let you work back then. No, and, they, yeah. and, and I know this. In the Cameroon tax, I'm going to say it was probably between four and $8,000 per year. Yeah, it was some. And, and so it actually almost caused wow. me a problem my senior year. Right. But so I, my friend Rami, I mean, the people who read from the center understood that. I was like, I can go to the movie. Like you go into the movie, <laughs> right? Because wow. I don't have the money. And for my special kid, because... I had so much work anyway, you know, you know, uh, academic work and stuff like that. I was really busy, but it was a situation where, like, okay, you know, you, you get the whatever gear the school gave you, you go eat and you go to school for free. But outside of that, there's, you know, if you if you want to go to a movie, you want to do this, you, you can't only, only, unless somebody is supporting you, right? So, so it's not only about that. And I think the frustration everybody knows is like, when you see that happening, and you see how much money the school are making off of all this athlete, right? And how much like other people are getting paid <laughs> off of that when the people who are the product of all of this are not getting anything. I think that's where the disconnect is. And, yeah. and, and that's what people get frustrated. But everybody knows it, but it's, it's, you know, for the people, the NCAA who run it, they don't want to change it because it's benefit them. <laughs> so they don't yeah, want right. to share Well, here's the, the whole... <laughs> The, the whole model is about to get disrupted because if you start having to pay the players, then you can't pay the coaches at a professional level because yeah. that money's got to come from somewhere. from somewhere. So if everything becomes coming down, then everybody loses their, you know, ADs aren't getting paid $2 million. Coaches aren't getting paid $5 million. And at the same time, you know, Mike Krzyzewski or anybody, they get to do credit card commercials. They get radio shows and you don't get any of that. My, my, and who knows this, my philosophy is, I would, you know, give them almost like a work study type of allotment. And for a guy like you who's at a big time school, I would put the rest in escrow that the players could access when they graduate. And in return, you could go to the bookstore in future years and sign jerseys and do that all type of thing. So it incentivizes you to come back to the college and it, it incentivizes the college to benefit and everybody have, have former players keep coming back. Um, you know, there's different models. It might, you know, it's a perfect, but there's got to be a better way. I mean, the whole Connecticut situation where if it's a bagel, you could eat it, but if it was a bagel with cream cheese. That was, <laughs> that was, it, that was not allowed. And um, I think it was uh, uh, Napier, Shabazz Napier brought that up that, you know, if, you know, that he asked for when he got back from a UConn game at like three in the morning. And that's the other thing you guys get back at crazy hours and it's not a given that the food places are open on campus. No, it's not. And so then, okay, you get back at midnight from Villanova. You obviously won because you're Georgetown. And, um, <laughs> and, you know, and, and then, and then the, the only way to get food is you guys got to scrounge up money to go out to McDonald's or get something because nothing's open and you're hungry. Um, yeah. you know, from that standpoint and, and, you know, and, and they, it, you know, I won't get into it because I understood the time and commitment you guys put in and then the guy, and then you got kids, you know, wearing your jerseys across campus and you're not getting anything from it. 
Yeah, and those were the crazy things for me. Like, in my argument, even at the time when I went to argue in front of this committee, I didn't argue for much. I said, just give us a stipend, a monthly stipend, right. I don't know, five hundred dollars. Like, it was not, it was nothing, you know, like crazy. I said, give us a monthly stipend. I don't know, five hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, where we can use that to do other things that other kids want to do as well. Like, that was just it. But yeah, like when I graduated. They say I couldn't even have my jersey. They were giving our jerseys to like high school and whatever. They say it was against the law. That I couldn't have any of my stuff. And I still don't. <laughs> like I don't because of that. So it was like, okay, so you 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 can play, you can do all this stuff, whatever. Uh, but yeah, you can't even have your own jersey. And then you can't, we can't give you money for this. Like you, we can't pay your taxes there that you're supposed to pay as a foreigner now. Like you, it was all these things. It was just like, you know, unbelievable. You know, well, yeah. Well, yeah. And, and not to editorials, it's guys like you, quite frankly, who should be working at the NCAA because you you've got the educational background. You can you've been years away, so you can appreciate him and Jay you played overseas. And then and then you were you were an athlete, so you can relate to what these athletes are going through, and you can educate those. And you're old enough to have expertise, but not too old that you can't relate. And the NCA has got to get, I mean, like I said, Ed O'Bannon thing is a disruptor, but it's going to be, I mean, like I said, you know, I mean, you know, the NCA is playing, you know, in a world of uh, HD and and Netflix, they got a VCR. I mean, they're, they're, they're operating 20 years behind and they're going to get burned. I mean, the $500, they're, they're, let me tell you, man, the $500, they're going to be crying that they didn't offer you that $500 because now the horse is out of the barn. And it's going to be more like five thousand dollars, and the, and the, and they and they can't withstand it. They can't, you know, X amount of programs make money. It's not, you know, and so it's going to be interesting to how this shakes out. And I, I'm glad. I hope there's more disruption. I hope so. I really, I, selfishly, I hope so for every kid who's coming behind. Maybe they'd be the one who benefit <laughs> for it. Really, I I think that the schools and they had a great time for years and years. The coaches who benefit from great, uh, but I think you know that pie needs to be shared a little bit more. John, do you have to go? I know we're gonna we're gonna do this or that. You're gonna stay around, okay? I'm staying around. Staying around. All right, okay. let's do the this or that. The rapid fire. Buckle your seatbelts. Let's rock and roll here. All right. Quick answers. Well, sometimes they're not quick answers because John likes to editorialize and jump in. For the record, Ruben, uh, I want to be sensitive to your time, but John, John did not like this segment. And I can tell you, it's it's of all the feedback that we get from our listeners, this the, the feedback that we get with this rapid fire has been uh, incredible. So hopefully you enjoy it as, as much as John does now. All right. Um, what's more important, a PER or an APM? or shooting and free throw percentage in the last two minutes of a game decided by five points or less. So while he's thinking about the answer, the PER is a player's. See, <laughs> see, Ruben, Ruben, see, Ruben, here's the problem. Here we go. If Jeez. he has to, you have two degrees from George Gaff, and he has to explain to you the question. He's the problem. The question is the problem. You're a highly, ed- you shouldn't have, if, when who has to explain it to you, it's a bad question. I'm That's why I don't like this segment. I'm explaining to the listeners. <laughs> PER is a player's efficiency rating, and the APM is the adjusted uh, uh, math. So, all right, go ahead. What was the last one? A free throw? So the, or the shooting and free throw percentage in the last two minutes of a game decided by five points or less. Uh, I'd say the shooting the last minute of the game decided by five point or less. So t- tell everyone real quickly, this is a passion of yours, right? You love metrics. And so some people are old school and they like the eye test. And, you know, this is something that has changed professional sports across the board from uh, whether players should uh, engage in load management because statistics show that there's less injuries to actual statistical data in terms of whether Kobe Bryant was worse going to his left off the dribble and shooting versus going to his right. So it's, it's a huge part of the game. I love it. Um, statistics uh, do lie and they don't lie. Right. Yeah. I missed your question. 
So I was just saying like, there's, there's, it's, it's, did you hear the load management part? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the, 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 the metrics goes from, from that, from whether or not a player should sit because there's less injuries, Yeah. whether you're a pitcher and you rest or, or a basketball player versus uh, whether Kobe Bryant going to his left is less efficient than, you know, going to his right when he, when he was playing, you know, those types of things. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm a data scientist by training, so I do love those things, but I do try to balance them as well uh, with the eye test, as we call it, <laughs> from yeah. my experience as a player. I think certain things make sense, um, especially when you talk strategy about how to play someone. I mean, honestly, like sometime, it, it's been going on for years. I think analytics took it to a different level. You know, when you had really, really good coaches, they would say, this guy only do, does this or that, whatever, trying to do X, Y, Z. Um, and then they kind of trying to push it like, hey, it doesn't matter if he goes left twice and score. We still know that's his weak spot, right? So just keep sending him left, you know? <laughs> and that's where it gets tricky because then uh, the game is emotional, is the coaches, and they're like, ah, maybe those guys, I don't know if I should trust them. So you kind of react now against what analytics says because you say hey the guy scored two bucket so maybe he's on fire right <laughs> and, and you take a different approach so um the load management part um or automatic um that's also fairly new to me i think because also by nature i'm a science guy <laughs> i was pre-med so i understand a lot of that things i think that maybe some teams uh, how do you decide? I think the issue for me, I think for many people, even within the, the analytics groups, uh, within teams, uh, when those decisions are made about, you know, how many minutes you play a guy, you know, 20 minutes versus 22. How do you determine those 22 minutes or those two, min those two minutes on top of that versus 20? You know, I think that's what to me, um, there's a lot of wiggle room and the people who make the decision um, make their decision but I'm not sure that uh, there is, there's a, a, a science behind it that fully, fully, um, you know, uh, basically can make it or break it, you know? Like, yeah. uh, uh, so I, I think to me, that's where you get a little dicey, uh, but the notion of resting a player, maybe a day or two, whatever it may be, I understand the concept of it. It's just the detail within it that sometime um, I'm not sure that, you know, the, the necessary right. To put it so, that way. so you're up three, you're on defense, under 10 seconds to go. Do you foul? I'm fouling. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fouling. I played in Europe. I had a coach um, in Germany. We actually won the natural the championship uh, with him. Oh, no, no, we're fouling. We actually, it was worse. <laughs> We will foul. We will foul if we were uh, no. What we do sometimes? So we'll foul if we're up three, <laughs> and you have the ball. We will foul, and sometimes we will foul to get the ball last. So we might be down one. We will foul you sometimes, wow. and you might go up one, and then we won the ball, the last possession. That's how we roll with him. <laughs> <laughs> crazy <laughs> yes oh, man that's crazy uh chin chin or puff puff and, oh chin chin is like uh yes so i know what you're talking about that's a tough choice john stop shaking your head these that's are a bad tough questions choice. this is why i don't no. like this section this will be edited out this is, <laughs> this is bad this is bad so chin chin um, is like chin chin is like it's made up for dough um it can be very crunchy or kind of soft. It's almost like a, not, it's not cakey. Um, it's, yeah, I don't know. And puff puffs is like beignet. We call it beignet. Like you've heard like in New Orleans, they have those beignets. Yeah, beignets, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, so actually it's funny. My, we just had beignet for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so God. I would have to say puff puff then because I eat more of it and my kids love it as well. Everybody loves it oh. in my house, so. So, oh, so food in DC, Portland, or Philly? I'm sorry, Portland. <laughs> wow. Food in Portland. Interesting. 
Uh, okay, so food and it's Greece. close. It's, it's really close. It's, okay. it's really close with DC. Wow. Uh, DC well, may well, have well, it's, it's very close with DC. DC may have maybe I'm not sure if DC have more variety. Poland, at least when I was there years ago, you know, it just so much diversity. The people, well, whatever. What was your what was your go to place in Portland? I had many. I had actually I had like some little place with no name. Like I go to, I don't go to like expense. Right. I wasn't going to like expense. I would go once in a while. Um, right. I'm really like I'm one of those guys who try a lot of different food. <laughs> right. Um, so I didn't have one particular place, but I love breakfast. So there was a place that after practice, pretty much I was there all the time to get so, breakfast. So Ruben, <laughs> are you a diner? So are you a diner type of guy? Oh boy. Um, I wasn't necessarily a diner type of guy unless I know there's a, di- a really good diner that somebody told me about. <laughs> so so if, I, if you tell me about a good diner Did you ever go to the uh, area, so in, go. In, the, in the DC area, it might've been too far out of your way. Did you ever go to Tasty Diner in Bethesda? Mm. There was also one in Silver Spring. There was a- 24 there hours. A, I, I may have gone to the one, maybe one of Bethesda, or maybe it was the one by the courthouse. Which one was that? Yeah, there was a diner I used to go to all the time. I can't remember which one. Okay. John, ask the question. So are you, a, so if you go into a diner and you're a breakfast type of guy, do you do a waffles, French toast, or pancakes? You got to get one. Waffle. There we go. So here's so my me, question. Yes. In your days, in all your travels, did you ever come across a Waffle House? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I came into a Waffle House and um, it, it happened twice and I've never went back, sorry. <laughs> wow, that's so sad. What, ha- what sorry. happened? Sorry. <laughs> it was so greasy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, <laughs> so I was so I was in the G League for a little bit. I got hurt, whatever, but I still ran for a little bit. And that was my first time. We had a, a, a way game somewhere and we stopped at a Waffle House. I've never been to a Waffle House. And I'm sitting there and she's making us <laughs> pancake and stuff. And I'm seeing just oil and oil drip out like oil. <laughs> <laughs> So the second time we got someone again, it was only chosen. I'm thinking, okay, maybe it's different here. I'm like, no, maybe it's a Waffle House thing. Like, like <laughs> sorry, John. I was like, yeah, you're okay, banned. Say, you're banned from so. sharing your story now, John. We're gonna we're gonna move on. Oh. Okay. Sorry, John. Uh, okay, iPad or Surface Pro? Uh, Surface Pro. Would you rather be able to speak every language in the world or talk to every animal? Speak every language in the of world. Of course, yeah. John would rather speak to the animals. It's just maybe we are like that. I don't know. <laughs> uh, fill in the blank. Kobe Bryant was? Uh, one of the greatest. Um, one of the, the greatest competitor of all time. Obviously, one of the winners. So, yeah, I still remember the first time I played against him. So, yeah, it's a vivid memory in my head. How was that? (laughs) Uh, He did to me what he does. He did to everyone. (laughs) There was a switch. There was a switch on the three-point line. He kind of looked at me like, really? What are you trying to do? (laughs) And I'm, you know, I'm a very proud, I was a very proud defender and long and, you know, all over the court. And he just like looked at me, did a couple of dribbles, whatever, he did three point shot. I was like, okay, I guess so. <laughs> well, at least he didn't, at least he didn't posterize you. <laughs> no, he did. No, he did. Um, he did he did not. <laughs> but let me ask yeah, you. Yeah, he just he just made it so easy. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, for sure. Let, let me ask you this real quick about Kobe, because you you're a big proponent of equality, and uh, this is women's history month. And, um, <clears throat> you know, Kobe reinvented himself uh, after his career, obviously, with his, with his uh, family, his daughter, um, you know, that was playing basketball and his involvement with the NCAA and, and a lot of players in particular with Sabrina. 
and and the W. I, I, how impressed were you with how committed he was to promoting the women's game, which doesn't get enough credit? Um, I mean, very impressed, to be honest. I'm a big proponent of women, of course. I have two daughters. Yeah. But even though I said I have three sisters, uh, wow. with six of us with three boys, three sisters. Wow. We're blessed we still have our parents around in Cameroon. Um, I, I am a huge, huge proponent. I was with a few teammates at Georgetown. You know, we would stay to watch the girls play. You know, they didn't get um, not a lot of people coming to watch them play. We would stay to watch volleyball. We had a volleyball team. Um, I appreciate women and, you know, they just like us, they do their best. They excel at what they do. <laughs> They're just as smart and talented as we are. So Kobe, um, I'm sure in part because he has daughters, uh, you know, how he was promoting the game <clears throat> and all the players even today, you know, that we see left and right in the NBA who really try to promote the, 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 the women's game. I think it's great. It's awesome. Um, hopefully, all of us as a really culture around the world, I think hopefully we can come to a point um, where, you know, we all value them. We really value what they bring and, and um, we encourage them and help them as much, you know, as, as we can because I think they, they're just like men, really. <laughs> you know, they, they're just a time to just like, great. Same thing in the workplace. I'm a big proponent of that. Uh, I think you know, women should be treated equally, remunerated equally <laughs> as men. So all those discrepancies, I don't understand it. <laughs> uh, I've been around like very, very smart women, very, very smart women, um, or even from an analytic standpoint, you know, uh, great women. So it's, you know, it's one of those things that all of us, I think as a society, um, you know, we just have to keep bringing up to attention as much as we can and try to uh, reduce the gap and, and hopefully at some point make it equal for everyone. Yeah, well, it'll take a couple of generations, but, but we'll definitely get there. There's just too many old white guys running the country <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, women of color have it worse, uh, I think, in many yeah. ways than... than uh, the, the gentleman of color in this country. Uh, okay. Uh, inside the NBA on TNT, Kenny, Shaq, Chuck, or Ernie? Oh, you got to go with Shaq. <laughs> He's uh, involved in some controversy lately, though. So Shaq is blank. Uh, man. Uh, <laughs> Shaq is... I mean, he's the biggest guy who can get away with anything. <laughs> Definitely. Um, uh, my my right, I mean, Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Finish. yeah. No, I mean, he, um, my first game uh -oh. against the Lakers. <laughs> get ready, John. Rookie, as a rookie <laughs> uh, in L.A. Um, so I basically learned the day before, two, or two days before that I made the team. <laughs> We're traveling to LA and, you know, they're, they're kicking us. And I think it was maybe five minutes left in the game, you know, garbage minute for rookie. I'm happy. I just get to be on the court. <laughs> so coach takes like Ruben on the court. Yeah, Ruben is running, jumping on the court. And Shaq, they have not done a substitution yet. So Shaq is still in the game. <laughs> so obviously I get in the game and he's looking at me. Ooh, that person, like he asked for the ball. So he asked for the ball and trying to make, do like a turnaround jump shot, which he wasn't known for anyway. So obviously I'm just going up to not trying to block a shot, but obviously trying to make him miss. So he missed the shot and he was so mad that I dare <laughs> <laughs> challenge him. So the next play, he is screaming, give me the ball, give me the ball. And they give him the ball. And he just started pounding me on the side. And I'm on the court with Sean Kim and Scotty Pippen. And I just like trying to grab him and trying to foul him, which I did. And Sean Kim is like, look at me, he's like, Ruben, man, and not so nice word. You know, he said, that guy is big as I don't know what. I'm just like, <laughs> 
<laughs> and Scotty Pippen goes, Ruben, I was going to help you, but I could. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That was, yeah, that was funny. But uh, to me, he was the most, I've never seen a guy that big, that athletic. I, 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 it was the most impressive athletic guy that I've obviously ever played against. Um, he, he was just so dominant. I mean, I, Ruben, I saw him play in person his freshman year at LSU against Kentucky. I was four rows from the court. It was unbelievable. Freshman year at LSU, he was a man among sports. I mean, at that level, it was unbelievable. And he was skinny. Yeah, and he, he could was run up. Skinny. He could run up. And actually, if you go back, you know, on that team was Chris Jackson, the shooting oh, guard. Rauf. Right. And the guy that was supposed to be the superstar on that team the was other Stanley big guy. Roberts. Stanley Roberts. Yes. That was – that him. was, and Stanley Roberts, this is a true story, Stanley Roberts had a breakaway dunk, and he missed the dunk so bad that Kentucky had a fast break going the other way at <laughs> midcourt. The ball hit off the rim, and it was – it went the whole half court, and it was a fast break going the other way. It was – but people – I, I heard that, about that guy, Stanley Roberts. Yeah, and he then he, he ate his way – he ate his way out of college in the NBA. I mean, he was – he, he was kind of like, if you remember, I'm, I'm dating myself, Daryl Dawkins. He was yeah. kind of the Daryl Dawkins. The Dar- yeah. Um, but he was supposed to be, he was high, he was the high recruit. Now, Shaq was a recruit, big time. Stanley Roberts was the number one recruit in the country. Oh, wow. And they, and they, and they were freshmen together at LSU. And I think Stanley Roberts went to the, tried to go to the pros after his sophomore year, probably was failing out. Um and and Shaq obviously stayed, and that's but that became the problem because Chris Jackson left, and Stanley Roberts left, and it was literally like four guys you've never heard of, and Shaquille O'Neal, so they tripled him, and that's why he had to go pro because yeah. it was pointless to play. But anyways, yeah, all right, yeah, uh, definitely the the most the most dominant big oh. guy that I I've seen, you know, with my own eyes. Yeah, that's that's incredible. Is it wrong for vegetarians to eat animal crackers? <laughs> John, what do you think of that question? <laughs> it's not a this or that question. That's why the whole problem. I, I'm not interested in your opinion. <laughs> uh, no. So my wife is <laughs> vegan. <laughs> wow. My wife is vegan, and uh, uh, she called me a cheegan, a cheating vegan. <laughs> nice. um, with my boys, for once in a while. You know, we we have to eat meat. <laughs> right? Does she prefer Impossible? Uh, she yeah, she she eat Impossible stuff. And oh yeah, interesting. She, she became vegan a few years ago. Um, she became vegetarian first and then transitioned to being vegan. She never really actually liked meat when I met her, so it was an easy transition for her. I, mm-hmm. I struggled. I struggled for a while <laughs> trying to do that. Now, as we kind of used to it. But once in a while, you know, have a steak yeah. here, a fish. They've have come a long. Meat. They've come a long <laughs> ways. Yeah, right. They've yeah. they've come a long ways. Though when we when we when you were in college, like it was like eating cardboard. But it, it's it's definitely a lot better. Even a couple of years it. ago, honestly, even from even from three yeah three four years ago, it has changed a lot. I mean, totally. some of the stuff that early on she was buying and we're cooking, so we laugh about it now because. There, you can buy the, the vegan eggs and yeah. you get used to it. It tastes like it now, it seems like it tastes like eggs, you know. Right. <laughs> it's like, yes, the meat, certain meat and stuff, vegan meat. But even a couple of years ago, some of those stuff totally. were it, it was hard, <laughs> definitely hard. So, the most important things you did not learn in school common sense, making babies, or how to play sports. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> I um I mean I didn't learn common sense in school. <laughs> All right. Uh washing your car or vacuuming your house. Uh oh. vacuuming the house. Interesting. The kids yeah. will do the car. Uh yeah. yeah. So some, what do you prefer putting in your salad? Croutons, tomatoes, or bacon bits? 
vegan bacon bits? So you already have to cross that one. Um, croutons. Croutons. On a plane, would you rather drink, eat, sleep, or watch a movie? Uh, watch a movie. Name something you buy by the roll. Toilet paper, wrapping paper, or tape? Toilet paper. <laughs> something that you think will be here in 100 years. A cure for cancer, flying cars, or teleportation? Flying cars. <laughs> Name something you smell before you buy it. Lotion, flowers, candles, or deodorant? Uh, deodorant. If you could be anybody for a day, who would it be? For a day. Warren Buffett. Wow. That's, that's a great call. Favorite TV show growing up? American TV show? <laughs> um, sure, or whatever. No, the only uh, Dynasty is the only American TV <laughs> show. Wow. Wow. <laughs> we, That's so, yeah, it's a, it's a, so the, 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 we had, when I was growing up, we had one television, the national television. Wow. And it was start, first of all, it started like it was only one hour a day and then it went to four hours a day, whatever. And then they start supporting us with American show. So it'll be one at the time <laughs> for however long they can stretch it. Um, and sometimes they will, you know, we have no electricity, like they will cut the electricity like an entire neighborhood. <laughs> so they have to play the show wow. again. The follow, it was once a week, once a week, Per episode, and then if if some segment of the country for some reason the electricity was cut, which happened a lot, you just keep pushing that the the, the same episode next oh week. You know, can stretch it. So I grew up watching as American show Dynasty, and the wow. last one was what is it guys call it nine nine oh two what what is it called Beverly yeah, Hills two one oh yeah yeah. So that was the wow. show when I was leaving Cameroon. But it was kind of still in the beginning. Um, Ruben, you'll like this, Ruben. 90210, David, I think it's Daniel Starr was the producer and director. You'll appreciate this. 90210 was based off of Churchill High School in Potomac, Maryland. True story. Wow. Be and you know Churchill. You know the type of yeah. it's out in Potomac, really ritzy, but it wouldn't sell ritzy, on yeah. Fox. So he basically, because he went there, he took... Churchill and put it in, 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 in California. But the idea of the show is actually based on Churchill High School in Washington, D.C. True wow. story. Yeah. So we so we we love Dynasty, but that's the only show we <laughs> That's crazy. And I know too for no. Uh, I thought when I left camera, I was like, I was I used I was uh, I told my siblings, oh, I can't wait to get there. I'm gonna watch all the episodes, all the stuff. And then I came here like, no, there's a ton of other stuff. And there's basketball. <laughs> and I never watched, right. it, never watched any. But yeah, Dynasty. Yeah. And Dallas That's was classic. another show that we of watched. Well. <laughs> Fantasy, Fantasy Islands in that same group. Uh, Jordan or LeBron? Uh, <laughs> seriously? Um... Jordan, nice. and I play with LeBron. <laughs> what if uh, LeBron? But Jordan, yeah. What, what if LeBron wins two more rings? Um, yeah. It's to me, it's not so much about rings. Got it. Um, okay. Yeah. I think because if you talk about rings, then people talk about you know Michael never lost. You know, which right, is yeah. by itself and just set him apart. Um, I love LeBron. I played with him in Cleveland when I got traded yeah. there. And I just think they're just so they're different players to me. Um, yeah. And I didn't watch Jordan as much, but I watched a lot of Jordan. I just think, you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I personally don't like to measure them because I just wanted two different players personally. Mm -hmm. Steve Nash or Kyrie in that same vein? Woo! <laughs> Man, uh, also depending on who you want. Um, I mean, 
Steve Nash was just an intellectual, great passive flawed general, which Carry is not Carrie's more of a scorer with crazy handle. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you come up with those things. <laughs> Answer question. Uh, I'd probably take Steve Nash. Depending Steve. on what I want. Yeah. Steve I'm Nash or what? I'm not saying he's the most talented well, of the two. Yeah. 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 Style that you prefer. Uh, so, so Steve Nash or Wardell Curry? Steve Nash or Del Curry? Wardell. Huh? It's sort of it's sort of a joke. Wardell. Steph's real name is Wardell, so I'm calling him Wardell. Steph Curry. So, so Steve Nash or Steph? Curry? Oh, Steph Curry. Greatest shooter ever. Uh, Larry or Magic? <sighs> You are cold. <laughs> you call me those things. Um, <laughs> Larry or Magic? Yeah, Magic. Yeah. Would you rather be covered in feathers or black mud? Can I say neither? <laughs> John, what about you? I'm going with neither. Would you rather see 10 minutes of your future or someone else's future? Um, someone else future. Would you rather be able to make every green light for the rest of your life when you're driving or never have to stand in line ever? And... Um, make every green light. <laughs> Candy or popcorn at the movies? Um, I, I didn't get it. I think we got a little thing. With the Can't, candy or popcorn at the movies? Oh, Ah, uh, popcorn. With butter, right? Oh, with butter. With a lot with of butter. butter. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Two more questions, and then the final question that we always ask. What kind of car do you drive that allows you the comfort that you need? <laughs> um, a Chrysler 300, but nobody can sit behind me. <laughs> <laughs> John, we're going to put you back there when he comes to town. Uh, and did you have a special bed made for you? No, um, we have. I have a king size bed, so I basically kind of <laughs> can pass a little bit. <laughs> Feet hanging off the edge, huh? Okay, so you're gonna. So, do you want to? Are you looking? Do you want to get in? Uh, back into professional sports? Do you want to have try an analytics job? I mean, I, I can't understand how you, people aren't knocking down your door. <laughs> um, I mean, ideally, I would like to go back into sports. Um, whatever happened last year happened, COVID, whatever. But ideally, I would love to get back into sports. Um, so right now, I don't really know what opportunity might open in that area. And um, I tried last year to see, obviously, as you guys know, there was not really much happening. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the data science world is where I'm looking a little bit now, just because I have that as a skill, but it's not right. actually something I want to do really long-term. It's not, um, but I may have to jump in there just you know, why waiting? I don't know. Ruben, um, here's my here, here's my recommendation real quick. Here's my recommendation. Get your agent to call the NBA uh, network and you need to have your own data analytics analyzing each game every night. I don't need one more athlete telling me who's this and who's that and cheering and all that. You could do a whole segment breaking down the teams with the best analytics, most underrated teams, how teams are getting the the most out of their players based on the salary, based on the things. And you could do all this stuff that there, there's your stick. There's your niche. Yeah, that's a great stick that you just said. Yeah. Because um, it's, it's not being done. You know, I, I don't mean it's done more in hockey. It is talked about more in hockey, the analytics and how it's used, you know, 23 basically. front offices have analytics guys, mathematicians like yourself. And just on a side note, most people, the people that run hedge funds, 
they're not business guys, they're math guys. Yeah. You know, so the whole, I mean, so you get all, you get all that. That's just my, I didn't, I didn't want to interrupt, but I, if I forgot it, I was going to be upset. <laughs> no, no, it's a <laughs> great story. <laughs> No, so I'm, I'm, yeah, so for now I'm looking to it, and I think I also mentioned to Michael, I have a friend also who's been, I probably going to talk to him in a couple of weeks. Um, we play together. He's in um, basically wealth management, and they have their own little firm. Actually, they're doing really well for, uh, for what they have, but they, they have a sports entertainment section, so it's kind of been recruiting me to join him in that area as well. Um, cause he's, I'm not concerned because he's very like, he's one of those guys really trying to help guys, people want to help players and all that kind of stuff. So I'm looking at that potential as well. If I do it, we'll see what happens when that goes. Um, but in, in the ideal world, like, yeah, it would be working sports, although, you know, it, it gets, <laughs> it gets a little crazy. You know, it's very, you know, there's the, being in that, it been in that circle, um, you know, you always you have to know the right people, the networking, and that kind of stuff. So sometimes you get a little dicey as well. So I don't know. So I'm I'm weighing the option that I have and, and really trying to see what I can do that I can really enjoy and, and still enjoy my family and, you know, not having to worry about uh, if the team doesn't do well, what's going to happen <laughs> to the whole team type thing. So. Well, somebody would, would be uh, <clears throat> um, really uh, lucky to have you. Uh, you know, back in the old days, we used to cold cut uh, letters out and phone calls. And, you know, you could just, uh, if you haven't already, just send something out to all the NBA teams or whatever and just say, hey, this is this is where I think I can help for two to four points every game and would love to be a bit if, if it's something that you haven't thought of yet, you know. So I, I think it would be. I think the opportunity at Georgetown could really use you in some capacity. You'd be a great model right. for the athletes that are there. You know, city. Just be, I mean, I don't know what your interests are, but to me, I think you're like a great model for both men and women for the athletic players that are there. And you, coming from Cameroon, you understand sports like soccer and other sports, not just the basketball. You're not just a basketball guy. You kind of have a broader picture. And I think that'd be kind of cool. We'll get Pat. I'm gonna make Pat. I'm gonna give Patrick a call tonight. And get on that. Yeah, call him. <laughs> <laughs> call him. <laughs> Tell him then I'll call him after. <laughs> <laughs> so I think John was setting setting up for this last question. So if you had a job in analytics, uh, you were the head of uh, one of the NBA teams. Would you hire John or me? Um, I hired John. Sorry, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> If you needed a, if you needed a professional we, skills trainer, you'd hire me. But yes, John. John's yeah. the analyst. So I, I agree. Ruben and I. I here's what would here, here's what would happen. The NBA draft would be on TNT, and we Ruben and I would take some guy that nobody has heard of, <laughs> and, and, and then and then and then what we would be doing is we would be nobody because Ruben, you were second round pick, and obviously there's only two rounds in the NBA. There used to be yeah. ten rounds and. You know, you and I would be going crazy in the second round. The undervalued picks that nobody thinks is anything. And we've got all these analytics. We're getting guys from Coastal Carolina, UNC <laughs> Wilmington, and and then, yep. and, and, and then and we're and we're loading it up and we're getting guys we're get, we're getting, you know, we're we're the money ball. We're gonna do the money ball of the NBA, the Oakland A's we're, of the we're NBA. Do the money ball thing. Yeah, so anyways. Appreciate your time. I, I, I didn't plan on going this long, but it's been a, a wonderful discussion and, um, uh, you know, pay to you and the utmost and genuinely appreciate you answering your only social media uh, when that they have to, to come on the show, share and share space with us and talk about uh, some fun things, but some other important thing mostly are mostly li listeners. Hope they, you know, hear the, the, the common theme that we like to talk about, which is to be agile, also massage and eight and, and hopefully keep this conversation. Like you said, you can't just sweep the carpet anymore. And, and it's, it's a bigger white issue than it's ever been. So we're just trying to do our part. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Um, 
definitely glad I was able to participate. It was fun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it was fun. So no, thanks for uh, what you guys are doing, really the message that you're sending and in, in, in what you're fighting for. I think personally is very important. Obviously it's important to a lot of people. It's important to my family. It's important, a lot of, important to a lot of people uh, that I know around. So um, thanks for being, you know, part of the fight and trying to bring about, you know, positive change, you know, in, in our society. So, um, you know, keep it up. And um, yeah, it was, it was definitely fun <laughs> talking to you guys and discussing awesome. all the topic. Well, anything we can do for you, uh, you know, we're, we're connectors in our own ways and, you know, uh, just six degrees of separation. You never know down the road what will happen. So we'll do everything we can. You know, oh, uh, I appreciate you it. Out. Thanks. Yeah. And Ruben, I'll let you know when I'm going to a Georgetown game next year. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, do that. Maybe we can call it and I can get down there. That'd <laughs> be great. Yeah. Scenario. I'll let you know. Yeah. yeah. All right. Sounds good. Much love, well, much respect, and stay safe. And uh, we'll, we'll stay in touch. All Thanks, right, Ruben. In touch. All right. Thank you. Good Thanks evening. So much. Good. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. He's awesome. He's awesome. So cool. Man. He's very All right. Cool Thanks, guy. brother. Yep, later. Yeah. Thanks so much again to Ruben Boomche Boomche for joining us today and being so generous with his time in this two part series. The former Georgetown Hoya great and former NBA player with the Portland Trailblazers. Remember, your voice matters when fighting systemic racism. Read a book, acknowledge your white privilege, watch a movie about institutional racism, call your local or state representatives, and or have a conversation with someone that doesn't look like you so that we can change the economic, educational, police, housing, and prison narratives that currently need to be changed in this country. For Dr. J, I'm Hootie Hoot. Remember, you can send us an email to thesportsdeli at gmail.com, or you can DM us on Instagram at Mike Hootner or on Twitter at Michael Hootner. Please mask up, and remember, Black Lives Matter. Peace.